All right, so um, let me um, start now um, with yet another lecture on systems genetic approaches. And um, there have been several um, lectures that described very sophisticated tools. And um, I will um, describe yet another approach um, based on structural equation models. And um, so um, the approach I uh, describe um, is published in um, several forms. So um, um, in one article, Jason Aiton, who was a former doctoral student, developed um, the so-called network edge orienting software, which is based on structural equation models. Um, also, some of this material can be found in chapter 11 of the weighted network analysis book. And finally, I will describe my application by uh, Chris Plezier and Paivi Payukante to study familial combined hyperlipidemia. So um, what about this um, network edge orienting software? Um, again, it uses this basic idea that SNPs or, um, can be used for learning directed networks. And, um, there has been a vast literature on that topic. So within the realm of um, genetic epidemiology, um, people have used that insight uh, in an argument called uh, Mendelian randomization for um, avoiding confounding issues. And, um, but lately, of course, um, this has been rediscovered and extended by other authors. For example, Eric Schad published an article that has been cited several times. And um, just to remind you, there's this fundamental paradigm of biology that says sequence variation precedes changes in gene expression, which then may um, um, affect protein changes and may ultimately give rise to um, clinical traits and diseases. And um, often, of course, we observe correlations between these various um, variables. But the one thing we are very certain of is that SNPs are causal anchors in the sense that when you have a correlation between a SNP and a gene expression profile, um, then in most cases it means the SNP causally affected the gene unless there are um, design issues in your data or uh, terrible things went wrong, you know. <laughs> now, um, just to give you an intuitive reminder of the what a edge orienting problem. So imagine you um, have these chromosomal markers, SNP markers, you have various gene expression levels, various genes. You have some clinical traits or physiologic traits such as insulin levels or HDL levels. And often um, correlations tell you, well, there's a strong correlation, a strong um, relationship between various edges. And when you just have, uh, when you only have a co-expression network, you, we really cannot dissect causal relationships. But what we hope to get um, as part of the solution of the edge orienting problem is um, edges that show directions. And um, in our um, application, we produce so-called LEO scores, which stands for local edge orienting scores. And a high LEO score is meant to suggest that we have strong evidence for this causal direction. For example, here the LEO score is 3.5, which would um, suggest there's strong evidence that this expression um, level is causally affecting HDL levels. That's what we want to accomplish. So um, the NEO software and also the R software that I will describe shortly takes as input a set of quantitative variables. So these could be physiological traits or clinical traits, but also, of course, gene expression levels. And another critical input is to um, our SNP marker data or genotype data coded in, an, um, in a numeric fashion. So when you, for example, 0, 1, 2, counting the number of the minor allele, but you could also have a recessive coding or dominant coding, but it, uh, it will be important to have um, a 
numeric coding of these markers. Now, um, here I of course emphasize the use of SNP markers, but if you have other causal anchors, um, you could use them as well. And then the software and the R functions output these scores, the LEO scores, um, for assessing causal relationships between these correlated quantitative variables. And um, Jason Aiton has um, produced the NEO software that gives you this type of an output where for each edge, for example, from trait A to trait B, the software calculates this LEO score, say 1.5, which then suggests that there could be a causal relationship where A causally affects B. So that's a hope. And um, the, as I mentioned, this NEO software and our approach is based on um, the evaluation of um, local structural equation models. And um, just to remind you, um, structural equation models um, have long been used in, uh, in, in statistics. They were first described in the 1970s. It's a well-established tool for dissecting and um, evaluating causal models. Um, Structural equation models are really a generalization of um, multivariable regression models. All of us know regression models, but of course people haven't um, stayed at that level. They've expanded it to um, these structural equation models. Oops. Now, um, in our situation, we restrict our attention to very simple causal models. So here I describe five different causal scenarios involving two quantitative traits, A and B, and one SNP marker. M stands for marker. And so um, we evaluate these five different causal scenarios. Um, for example, this one where the SNP marker causally affects trait A and then um, trait A causally affects trait B. That could be of great interest. But there are, of course, alternative causal scenarios possible. For example, the marker could actually affect trait B, which then affects trait A. Or the marker affects um, A and B simultaneously, and there is no causal relationships between A and B. And um, when you think about it, um, you could probably think of other causal scenarios, but um, our software can only distinguish these five types. Um, and why? Because um, we couldn't, um, we found other causal scenarios are um, um, indistinguishable from one of these. You know. Now this happens when you have a single SNP marker, for example. But also sometimes you have multiple SNP markers available and then you can come up with other causal situations. Um, but I don't talk about those today. The one thing to highlight is that my focus is on a single edge, meaning two quantitative traits. And um, earlier today, you heard, of course, um, a talk by Bin Zhang, and you will hear other talks by Jun Su, and um, also um, yesterday, um, Brian Yandel and um, Elias Chaibunitu described um, causal modeling approaches that involved multiple edges, really networks, causal um, networks comprised of multiple um, uh, nodes. And um, I have a much simpler scope and much more restricted scope here, you know. <laughs> um, in any event, uh, when you have a um, causal scenario, then you can evaluate how well your data fit this causal scenario by using um, this structural equation uh, model framework. And um, just to give you a glimpse of um, what is being done, it is that um, there is again a um, objective function that is being uh, minimized. And so when you have a causal model, it gives rise to a certain parametrization of the covariance matrix, right? Uh, what do I mean by that? So you ha we have a SNP marker, we have two quantitative traits, A and B, and we can form a 
a three-dimensional variance covariance matrix among those three variables. And so we observe this variance covariance matrix. I mean, this is just literally output of um, standard um, cover the cov function in R. Now, what does the causal model do for us? The causal model <coughs> suggests that this observed variance covariance matrix has a certain form. It, um, and this form is parameterized. There are certain parameters. And so, um, in the, when we evaluate the causal um, model, we um, actually fit um, the parameters by minimizing this function. And just to be clear, um, these um, straight line indicate the determinant. So we take the logarithm of the determinant minus the logarithm of the determinant of the observed variance component matrix and plus trace and so on. And m is the number of variables. So um, the SEMR package um, then um, finds the optimizing solution. This, um, it fits the parameters. And then after plugging in these um, minimizing values for th um, the parameters and multiplying it times the, um, the sample size, we arrive at a chi-square statistic. And this chi-square statistic um, evaluates the model fit. It's a, um, so if the chi for, uh, once you have a chi-square statistic, and here you have the corresponding t degrees of freedom, you can calculate a p-value. And this p-value um, tests the hypothesis that, um, about model fit. Which, and in our situation, we want to obtain a high p-value because it suggests that the causal model fits the data. Right? A low p-value means that the causal model that you study doesn't fit the data. But in practice, um, of course, you have a causal situation in mind. You want that the marker affects trait A and A causes B. You have a, a causal hypothesis. And so for you, a high p-value is good news because it says the data that you measured really fit this causal scenario that you outlined. So I, I make this point because throughout biomedical research, we are always opening the champagne bottles when we have a small p-value. But, <laughs> but not here. In this structural equation model setting, we want a high p-value. So to give you a f um, few more details, remember I had these five causal scenarios involving one single marker. And um, what I omitted earlier is there are certain parameter values. For example, when you have a causal edge from M to A, there is a coefficient, a path coefficient, alpha. And also, there are certain um, variables um, that um, model noise. So there's a, um, epsilon is the noise variable, and so on. And also, there's a parameter gamma going from A to B. And, uh, and the epsilon is a noise variance, so there's a, um, a parameter called sigma square measuring the variance. So although, although these models are very simple, they do involve certain parameters, alpha, gamma, um, sigma square. And as I mentioned, these parameters are being fit by minimizing this objective function. All right, and then um, what for each model, we then calculate a p-value based on this chi-square statistic that I mentioned. And so we end up with five different p-values. And so in principle, um, selecting a causal model is rather straightforward because you could say, well, I choose the causal model with the highest p-value as the one that fits my data. It's as simple as that. However, um, um, looking at all five p-values can be a tedious exercise, you know. And so, therefore, we um, have, uh, we define a um, statistic which is a relative model fitting index as follows. 
So remember, we are often interested in one causal scenario. The, um, the SNP marker causally affects a gene A, and that gene A causally affects, for example, HDL levels. That's our causal situation that we're interested in. And we get a p-value for it. But um, we divide this p-value by the um, best fitting alternative, by the p-value from the best fitting alternative model. Remember, there were four alternative causal situations, right? And so for each of these four causal scenarios, you also get a p-value. And so uh, um, then the, the um, p-value of the next best model can be obtained by forming the maximum um, p-value across these four alternatives, right? And so therefore this ratio um, of the um, p-value from your causal model of interest divided by the maximum over the four alternatives gives you a relative <coughs> fitting index um, for evaluating the fit of your model. And then um, after you obtain this ratio, we transform it um, um, using the logarithm with base 10. So what does that mean? So let's say this local edge orienting score, this LEO score, is, takes the value of 1, then it tells me the following. It tells me that my causal model of interest fits the data 10 times better than any of the alternative models. You know. Now, um, intuitively, this is a good evidence that it, well, it's 10 times better than anything else, and therefore it may be worth exploring, you know. So, um, to remind you um, how, how we um, go through a typical analysis, so, yes, yes, yes. Yes. Models, yes. But this fit makes it look like one is quite a bit better than the other four, but yes. really you've rejected the yes. null. So yeah. do you have support for that model or not? Yeah, let me repeat the question for the, uh, the camera. So the question was, could it be possible that actually all five p-values are significant, meaning none of the five models fit the data? And then, of course, when you form ratios, it could still be that one model looks much better than the others, but actually none of them fit. And, of course, that could happen, you know. <laughs> so um, everything that can go wrong will go wrong, you know, that's Murphy's Law. <laughs> um, so, yes, um, that can happen, and sometimes it does. And, um, and therefore, um, th this really highlights that this um, relative fitting index is actually just the first step. So it allows you to quickly look at certain traits A that are semi-interesting. But then after you find an interesting gene, for example, you then really want to go back to the individual p-values, look at them. But that's, even that is not enough because a structural equation models really allow you to output multiple fitting indices. There are very famous fitting indices such as RMSEA, CFI. There's a vast literature on fitting indices, wall statistics, and so on. And so in our software and also the SEM um, R package, which was um, developed by John Fox and his colleagues, they really output all of these fitting statistics. And no doubt you want to look at all of them before you publish your gene in a paper. It's, it's really a fruitful exercise. Having said this, we have several applications where um, the LEO score um, produced rankings that were very meaningful, you know. And um, remember, every speaker in this room emphasized that these causal analyses based on stationary data make a lot of assumptions, you know. <laughs> And so um, I think all of us are in agreement that whatever you come up with, um, always use biologic validation experiments. These are always just 
exercises in generating hypotheses. That's all it is, you know. Yes? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, so the, the question is, um, yeah, so um, to, we heard about several uh, statistics for comparing these different causal models. Um, for example, the CMST statistic from um, Elias Shaibub Nito and Brian Yandel, and also the AIC uh, measure um, that Eric Schad used in his paper, and uh, various other me measures. And um, so I realize how your head is spinning, being exposed to all of them, you know. <laughs> but here's the good news. When you have this very simple situation of two quantitative traits and one genetic marker, I claim that we would hopefully all agree on which model fits best, certainly if there's a strong evidence for one causal scenario. And we have done some comparisons, and uh, the results were very reassuring. So that's the good news for the simple models. When you come to more complicated models, the minute you have three quantitative traits, four, suddenly things start to diverge. And, um, and so I don't want to comment on it, but probably the other speakers have the strong opinions on which mo method works better. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in the situation, for example, like M to A to B, Yes. Before that A is um, also dependent on some other variable like age and gender, and yes, gender yes. etc. Yeah. Is there any way to accommodate that in this model? To yeah. make it simplified and still use it? Um, yes. Um, so the question is, what if you have yet other confounding variables, for example, age and gender and so on? So um, there are several ways to include these other variables. One is to literally include additional causal edges. If you feel that age affects gene expression levels, you could include it. And then you could um, fit a more complicated structural equation models. Just to be clear, structural equation models can deal with very complicated causal graphs. Um, and there is a vast literature on that. You know? So you in could include it at that level. But also, um, some of us use tricks where we first form residuals in some shape or form. You know? um, or you stratify the analysis. You f fit a causal model only on young subjects. You know? Things like, there are all sorts of tricks one can use. You know? But let me proceed with the lecture. And um, so this gives you a sense of how we calculate these LEO scores. So um, now, among all the criticisms that you can um, raise about these causal inference models, um, the one thing you probably um, un may not be aware of, that the Achilles heel is the genetic marker, OK? <laughs> That's my number one criticism. Um, as you know from um, human GWAS studies, um, you sometimes need tens of thousands of human subjects to find anything statistically significant. What does that mean? Often the SNP has a very small effect on, on the clinical trait and also on the gene expression levels. And I don't need to tell you if you put garbage in, you get garbage out. So if you use causal anchors that you are really not sure of or who have a negligible effect, you can, you can still calculate your causal scores, but things can go wrong. And so there's no, um, it's not a coincidence that um, most of these models have been applied to model organisms, for example, mice. Why? Because there we get hugely significant QTLs, you know, where we have more confidence in the causal anchors. But in human subjects, um, be aware of that limitation. So, and um, so in, for me, the, the critical step is to specify these genetic markers. And, in our software, we have certain ways of carrying out um, SNP marker selection. But the truth, uh, for example, based on a forward stepwise SNP selection approach, but the truth is I'm most comfortable if you start with a SNP that was published in three different articles using multiple linkage analysis, GWAS studies, a SNP you really trust. Start with, and therefore, my 
emphasis today is on a method that uses a single snap, you know, <laughs> because I'm pessimistic that you have multiple credible snaps. So in any event, once you have the snap, then the software um, allows you to look at thousands of pairings of genes and traits and so on, and it ranks these, you know. And as I said, um, you may end up with one or um, let's say one or more edges that appear to be causal. And then in step four, once you have a causal, uh, um, uh, um, an edge that has a significant Leo score, uh, a Leo score above the threshold, then you carefully evaluate the fitting indices of these SEMs uh, that I mentioned here, but there are many others. But even at that level, um, you, um, the evidence could be due to um, a SNP that, uh, let's say you have multiple SNPs, it, it is still highly dependent on which SNPs you selected. And therefore, I suggest that in a step five, you do a robustness analysis of your causal inference. So let's say um, here in this graph, I carried out a causal analysis based on three SNPs, but you could ask, well, what if I drop one of them? What if I add one of them? You know, ideally, you find evidence even if you drop some of these causal anchors. All right. So before I go to an application that was published, I wanted to now give you some R code. Uh, um, and so remember that this um, is actually part of the um, um, software tutorial that, is, that we started with um, in a previous lecture. Remember, these are the female um, liver example data from Jake Lucis. And uh, we already covered how we found modules, how we do module preservation analysis. But one section in this tutorial, which we skipped, was called uh, Systems Genetic Analysis with NEO. And um, so here I will just describe this approach. So um, why do, by the way, why do we call it systems genetic? Where does that term come from? Well, systems comes from that aspect that we do a module-based analysis. Where there's um, somewhere is a WGCNA part of it. But why do we call it genetic? Well, because we have genetic data. And um, so uh, remember, we found this blue module that was related to mouse body weight, OK, and various other uh, physiologic traits of interest. But also, we had over a thousand genetic markers available from this F2 mouse cross. And therefore, we could um, look for QTLs for mouse body weight. But also, we could ask, well, which of the module genes relate to the same QTLs? So um, remember, in order to find um, QTLs, or, or really SNPs that relate to mouse body weight, you can do a lot score analysis um, using the QTLR package. And we described that yesterday, or um, um, Brian Yandel described a wonderful R software tutorial for that. But um, also, you can really use a correlation test if you code the SNPs in this numeric fashion. And you can just um, ask, well, which SNPs have a significant correlation with body weight? And um, also, you can ask, by the way, can you see this? Yes, OK. You can ask for EQTL hotspots, meaning um, within a module. So you can ask, um, for, on the simplest level, you could ask, um, are there QTLs that affect the module eigengene? You know? Um, alternatively, you could ask among those several hundred genes in the blue modules, how many of them correlate with um, a SNP that also correlated with mouse body weight? You know? And we refer to, um, such, um, so to SNPs that affect many genes inside a module as a module QTL. And for the blue module, we actually found nine such module QTLs. But there was one QTL on chromosome 19 that was particularly exciting because not only did it affect a lot of uh, genes inside the module, but also it, it had a significant correlation with mouse body weight. 
And therefore, we focused on this one SNP as a causal anchor of the entire um, edge orienting analysis. So now in this final step, um, um, which goes towards finding key drivers of this module, we then um, calculate these LEO scores. Um, and um, so what do we evaluate? Notice there's this causal model that we evaluate. So we have this one SNP on chromosome 19, and we ask for every gene inside the blue module whether it relates to mouse body weight in this causal fashion, right? The SNP affects the gene expression level, and the gene expression level then affects mouse body weight. And um, to fast forward, remember one way to read the tutorial is by always looking at output, you know. <laughs> and so there is a function, an R function, called Leo single anchor analysis, which does exactly what the name says. It calculates a Leo score for a single anchor, meaning a single SNP. And um, what you see here, I evaluate whether this causal anchor causally affects trait A, which is the module eigengene, which, um, and then, which may subsequently causally affect mouse body weight. And when I, um, so the way to run this type of analysis is to just copy and paste the blue code, which I will explain to you in a second. But basically you copy it, you um, paste it into the R session, And what the R software produces are these Leo scores. And what do we see? They're negative. And so it means there's absolutely no causal evi uh, no evidence that this, um, that this blue module in its entirety causally affects mouse body weight. You know? So we, it's a negative finding. You know? Um, remember also um, in my previous lecture, I mentioned there was another module right next to this blue module that also related to mouse body weight. And also the brown module showed no relationship to um, mouse body weight. So it's a negative finding. How, however, the module um, was comprised of hundreds of genes. And as I said, a more meaningful analysis perhaps is to restrict the attention to all the genes inside the blue module and to evaluate which of the genes in the blue module show a causal relationship with mouse body weight. And so now um, this R code um, evaluates now every gene. It will take a couple of minutes. But to already tell you, we then um, focused on three genes that have a Leo score larger than three. Remember, this is on a, um, on a log uh, scale of, with base 10. So it's 10 to the 3. Um, so if one of these genes is implicated, for example, this gene, um, which is cytochrome um, P450 family 2, um, this gene, for this gene, there is um, strong evidence that it causally aff affects mouse body weight meaning this causal model fits a thousand times better than any of the four alternative models. You know. And um, so it, when we applied it to all the module genes, there were three hits, and only one of these um, probes um, was associated with the gene symbol. As I mentioned, this cytochrome P450-related um, gene. And um, actually, our colleagues had found that this gene was related to body weight, and they, they just um, uh, um, based this, their results on a QTL study. You know. So um, now it's interesting to produce a correlation table between all of the variables. Just I, I always like to look at correlations so that I get a sense of the effect sizes. You know. So remember, we started with this causal anchor, this one particular SNP. And we can just ask, well, how correlated was this SNP with the blue module eigengene? And the correlation is 0.2. I don't know how you look at it. If you are a GWAS person, that's a hugely, a huge correlation, right? <laughs> um, in any event. 
The, um, incidentally, this SNP also has a very significant correlation with mouse body weight. Again, that's a hugely um, a huge correlation if you have the perspective from a GWAS study. In any event, this SNP has a, a, a really extremely high correlation with this particular causal candidate gene. Remember how this, uh, this probe, this corresponds to the cytochrome P450 gene. Um, so this probe has a negative correlation of 0.70, you know. So what does all of this tell me? If you really believe the SNP, if you really think this SNP um, affects mouse body weight, then yes, this particular gene is interesting in its own right because it already has a very strong correlation with the SNP. You know. But further, apart from that, as I said, um, I when you focus on this local or, or this causal model, then using this SNP again leads to a, a fit statistic that indicates the causal fit is, uh, really works well. All right. Um, are there any questions? Um, let me show you the output. So notice um, the R command um, finished. And um, here we evaluated 524 genes that were inside the blue module. And so out of these 524 genes, only three genes had a Leo score larger than three. So they would be strong causal candidates if you assume um, that the um, a causal anchor is appropriate and make various other um, assumptions. Now, um, some of you may be interested uh, to learn more about the um, structural equation model R package uh, developed by John Fox. And I just wanted to give you just some statements to guide your uh, reading. So um, what you do, of course, in, uh, you have to read the SEM package into R. And so you just uh, um, do that by, um, for example, here copying and pasting. And um, now the other thing um, that is required when you evaluate these causal models is you have to specify the causal model. And so there is an, an R command within the SEM package called specify model. And um, here I remember I have these five causal models and for each causal model, I, spec uh, I need to specify it, and I do that. So this is causal model one, causal model two, and so on. And so um, um, it, here we use a certain formulation of causal models called the RAM formulation. But basically you say there's an edge from A to B. Remember the causal model one assumes that A causally affects B. Then I tell it this will be the name of the parameter, the path coefficient, it's beta. And then you can specify initial values if you have, uh, but here I say I don't know the initial value. Um, so in any event, you get these five causal, you specify these five causal models. And then the next thing is you need to calculate a model fitting p-value for each of these causal models. And this is um, accomplished by using this function model fitting p-value. And the function takes as input a structural equation model object. And then, as you notice, it um, makes use of the chi-square statistic and the degrees of freedom and calculates this um, p-value. And then there's another R function called Leo single anchor, which I used uh, a second ago. And it, um, of course, um, evaluates. Um, so this R function um, um, calculates these five different model p values and ultimately defines the Leo score in the fashion that I, note, um, that I described. It takes the log, ten, uh, log with base 10 um, of the ratio of these p values. You know. And so again, the purpose is to um, allow the data analyst to quickly prioritize thousands of causal models, right? Here I actually only had 524 genes, but sometimes you have 
30,000 probes and you could screen through 30,000 probes and say which of the 30,000 probes is interesting if I look for a causal one, you know. So that's the purpose. But again, the SEM object that we fit here, see here we fit this um, a causal model uh, using the SEM command and um, this object reports a host of fitting statistics by just running the summary statement, for example. So you would then carefully look um, at the genes that you found, whether they actually do fit things well. But never mind all the statistics. At the, the end, at the end of the day, what you really need is biological validation. So um, let's come back to the PowerPoint slide. And now um, I want to describe um, how we applied this type of approach to um, data um, for, um, for studying familial combined hyperlipidemia. And these are data uh, um, that were generated by Paivi Payukanti, who was the um, PI on this study, and Chris Plezier, who was the first author. So FCHL is... Um, of course, a, a lipid disorder, and um, it's characterized by um, um, elevated fasting plasma triglyceride levels, total cholesterol, or both. And um, Pai Vipayukante had previously carried out a linkage analysis in um, a Finnish data set and found one particular SNP that was highly associated with um, this hyperlipidemia. What does that mean for us? We really have a good causal anchor. That's what it means. There was strong evidence that um, it relates to hyperlipidemia. Now, this SNP was um, located in the 3' prime UTR of a transcription factor, this USF1, and um, um, Paivi Payukanto and her colleagues had used CHIP-seq data to show that, yes, this transcription factor mattered. And so in this study, then, um, uh, my collaborators um, looked at 70 extremely discordant individuals. Now, um, remember how we earlier discussed um, what kind of sample size is needed to do a causal analysis, and I completely agree with um, the statement, ideally you want several hundreds at the very least. Um, and that when you have a really good causal candidate, because if you don't, you want several thousand, you know. <laughs> but in any event, let's just um, be courageous and proceed with the analysis. So we, um, to, um, to defend this data set, so these were extremely well characterized individuals, half of them were um, on the low end of hyperlipidemia and high, um, half of them were at the high end. So these were extremely discordant individuals. And also, the other thing is we studied a um, relevant tissue. So these were fat biopsy samples, you know. But I do mention that um, a sample size of 70 gives you only 80% statistical power to detect a correlation coefficient of 0.33, right? That gives you a sense. Now, in order to make any sense of these data, we needed to ap um, apply a data reduction approach. And um, uh, of course, WGCNA is a, a, a proven method for uh, um, reducing the data. And so um, here we used uh, the blockwise module detection approach to find modules in roughly 15,000 um, genes. And uh, we ended up uh, with 28 modules. And so you've seen this graph before. So these are the 28 um, corresponding module eigengenes. And here are the um, FCHL component traits. And remember how I mentioned to you there's this one module in the middle, the TAN module, that has significant correlations with uh, total cholesterol, um, triglyceride levels, and importantly, also with the SNP that was um, implied in the linkage study. So that was a very interesting module to us. 
But um, of course, now one can look at hub genes in that module. But now, we, of course, we have this SNP, and we can do an exciting analysis. We can ask, um, is, the, is there evidence that this module eigengene causal, is causally related to um, disease status? And um, so in other words, we can evaluate this type of a causal model. Is the, this particular SNP, um, does it causally affect the module eigengene? And does that uh, causally affect some of these traits? And um, what we found is that the LEO score for the trait measuring fasting plasma triglyceride levels was 0.3 which is not terribly significant. What does that mean? Remember, it's um, a, a, a log-transformed value. It just means that the, this causal model fits better, uh, two times better than the four alternative models. Is two times better significant? Not really. Um, so in our paper, we recommend a, for the single marker analysis a, a threshold of one, meaning the model fits 10 times better. Having said this, this power was severely, uh, this study was severely underpowered. There were only 70 individuals, right? So, and therefore we lowered the threshold. Um, incidentally, when you calculate the LEO score for disease status, meaning FCHL, yes or no, the LEO score was 0.25, you know. There is a faint evidence that this model may be causally related to the disease. Um, now, perhaps a more meaningful analysis is to carry out this analysis on a gene level, where you now look at all the genes inside this TAN module, and I would ask, well, which of them are causally related, for example, to triglyceride levels. And it turned out that there were 171 genes that um, for which we found some causal evidence for triglyceride levels. And there were 18 genes for which we found evidence that they causally related to disease status. You know. Incidentally, often audience members ask me, can you use binary variables here? You know, because um, and um, I just echo what other people in the field say. They say, yes, you can, you know, with all the limitations, but uh, people use it, you know. Um, so here we code um, binary disease status in, um, in a numeric fashion, zero and one. Steve? Yes? Were, were the LEO scores significantly higher for the individual traits than the eigengene? Yes. Yes, they were. Um, sometimes much more, you know think one or, or, or even more. I forgot actually what threshold we used for, for finding these causal candidates. Um, I, I think we may have used one, you know. Mm -hmm. So in any event, we had these causal candidates, but now we're in a human setting. We really can't do validation experiments, knockout studies and so on. So we do the next best thing, we look at literature findings, you know. So here's a table of these 18 causal candidates. And um, in a second I showed, well here um, I report some uh, findings um, um, from the literature. And so many of these genes had been implicated. And um, Mark Keller in the audience may <laughs> recognize some of them. Um, other people have never seen them, fair enough. Um, <laughs> I briefly mentioned there was also a GBOS study uh, that has been mentioned now a couple of times by other people um, in human subjects by Kathirisan et al. And so what you can do is you can ask, um, are there SNPs that underlie these um, causal candidates? And were these SNPs implicated to be related to um, um, hyperlipidemia relevant traits in this GWAS study. You know? If so, there's indirect evidence that yes, maybe they may be causally implicated. And um, so yes, um, here um, my colleagues report various p-values um, from this study, but there was one particular gene of interest, 
Um, there was this one gene, the FAT3 gene, fatty acid desaturase 3 gene, and um, um, this was of particular interest because, again, we had found it, and also um, there was a SNP located within that gene that had been implicated in this GWAS study. And so then my colleagues um, focused on this particular SNP in the FAT3 gene and showed that even in this subgroup of 70 subjects from the Mexican population, there was evidence that this SNP related to uh, disease status. You know. So there was, again, some evidence that, yes, this FAT3 gene may be causally related. So just to remind you, why did we use WGCNA? It was, it was really um, needed in order to leverage this um, small data set. Um, we, um, it allowed us to find this very exciting module related to hyperlipidemia. We were able to use the KME, the module membership measure, in order to carry out a functional enrichment analysis for Go ontology categories. I, um, I, didn't, I think I didn't, um, I skipped that. There's one slide where I mentioned the goal results. They, they made sense, you know. We found lipid-related themes. And um, also, um, it allowed us then to restrict the causal analysis to the genes inside this module. And um, what I like about this study, it, it tells you that, uh, again, this causal analysis um, applied to a module uh, may provide an alternative way of arriving at these um, key driver genes. Bin Zhang described his approach for finding key drivers, um, but there are many other um, approaches for then um, looking at these sub-networks and prioritizing them. You know. Um, again, um, this, um, the R software um, that I just presented a second ago is, uh, corresponds to one of these book chap chapters. And here I acknowledge um, um, several of my collaborators, in particular Pai V. Paiucante and Chris Plezier, who uh, um, uh, um, were the authors on, on this um, systems genetic analysis. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, do you know the distribution of the males of, I mean, do you have any empirical ideas? Are they normally distributing? No, I, I wouldn't make this claim. So the question is, um, what's the distribution of the Leo scores? I, I don't, I'm not sure. I don't think it's normal. I forgot what it looks like, you know. It, it, all, it typically is negative. Uh, you know, it, it's actually hard to find um, a Leo score larger than one. Uh, that's what I would tell you. I often find that. Often I reanalyze re somebody else's data and I want to find causal candidates and really nothing shows up, you know. Yes, um, other questions? Uh, yes. No. So when we applied WGCNA to these 15,000 genes, that is what we call an unsupervised WGCNA analysis. So these genes were prioritized probably based on the variance or, or the mean expression value. You know. So then when yeah. you go on to do a go enrichment, yes. you restrict the go terms? Um, that's a good question. So. Um, Whenever you, let's say you start with a set of um, um, 15,000 genes and then you want to do a, a Go enrichment analysis or David E's analysis, then the question is, what is the background list of genes? Um, strictly speaking, you should, of course, only use the 15,000 genes that you started with as a background, you know. But many authors are lazy about it and they just use the, um, all genes and the gene in, in the genome as a background, you know. And um, I often follow that convention, what everyone else does, um, yeah. But that's even less uh, conservative than the question I was getting at, which yeah. is, 
Well, um, so the question is, was it surprising that this TAN module was significantly enriched with lipid-related GO categories? Um, so um, I don't think it reflected that we focused on lipid tissue because there were other modules that were not enriched with these lipid categories. Do you see what I'm saying? Remember, we had 28 modules and not every module uh, was enriched with um, lipid pro uh, metabolism related themes, you know. Having said this, um, I agree with your, the gist of your comment. Sometimes it happens by pre-selecting genes. For example, if you look at brain tissue and you select genes that are overexpressed in brain tissue, then da, you find neuron-related themes, you know. So yes, that could go wrong. And so be aware of that potential bias. Yeah, yeah other? Yeah. Uh, in the early genetics, uh, you said that uh, there Yes. But when you do the expression, um, you usually just have a, a very small sample. Yes. Yes. I assume, in theory, this method can be applied to that kind of data. But uh, can you comment on uh, what do you think is a best practice? Yes, so the question is that sometimes in genetic studies we are fortunate enough to have tens of thousands of samples, but for gene expression studies we may have a, a couple of hundred samples. And um, how to deal with that? Um, well, remember, we only need this very large sample size for GWAS studies because the effect sizes are so small. And so, as a workflow, you could start with a very large GWAS data set to find credible SNPs. And then when you do this systems genetic approach based on gene expression data or DNA methylation data or other omics data, you really then focus on these causal anchors because the hope is that the gene expression levels or methylation levels show stronger effect sizes with your clinical traits and therefore you get away with far fewer samples. And I think our um, applications demonstrate that. You know, sometimes a couple of hundred of subjects are sufficient. Even in this study by PIVI, if you are in the relevant tissue, um, human fat tissue, and study the trait, then we even as few as 70 samples allowed you to find um, highly significant relationships between a module and the uh, hyperlipidemia related traits. So yes, that works. Yeah. Okay, yes? Just to comment on your, your response to his uh, question. Yes. Uh, if I have to do the, uh, this genome-wide epigenome study, I will do in a reverse direction. Yes. The direction will be first find out the expression regulators or methylation regulators. Yes. Uh, and then use those limited number of uh, functional SNPs to test on the, test the association with phenotype because the phenotypes yes. are most of the time complex as yes. compared to the, yes. those quantitative traits like expression yes. or uh, methylation. Yes. Yeah, just to echo it. Um, so another strategy is to start out with the omics data, the gene expression data, find gene sets or regulators that matter for the trait. It could be a module, could be transcription factors or what have you. And then look at SNPs that underlie these genes, for example, that co-locate with them in some shape or form. And then use this set of SNPs in, I, I want to call it SNP set enrichment analysis, for example, for um, in a GWAS study. And by, I, I really um, think that it's a very promising strategy. I, 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 as a matter of fact, I use it myself, you know, so <laughs> in some of my uh, projects. Yeah. But with this, let me stop and remind you that um, this time um, lunch start ends a little bit earlier at 1.15. So please be here because there will be another very exciting lecture from Bin Zhang. Yeah. Thank you. See you at lunch. Yeah.